Yes. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 16th, 2023, the Traffic and Transportation Committee meeting of Community Board 8. My name is Kelly Buford, and I am the chair of the TNT Committee. With me are my um, committee members, are the committee members, Dan Paternak, who is Vice Chair, Deb Travis, David Gelman, Mary Ellen Gibbs, Chris Calhoun, and Sylvia Alexander. Um, I, again, am the chair of the meeting, which means I get to um, serve as the presiding officer of this meeting. And I do, um, because we typically have a lot of questions, we like to limit discussions um, from the gallery to two minutes per person. Um, I, um, my colleague, Mary Ellen Gibbs, is going to serve as the timer for this meeting, and she will raise um, a sign or a hand when it's two minutes, when your two minutes are up, and then we will ask you to respectfully um, stop speaking. And then if we have time, we will come back to you if you have any additional questions. Okay. With that being said, I would like to move all, um, to the first item on the agenda, which is the committee chair report. Um, the only notice that I have that it has not yet been posted for the committee for the community is that there will be um, a full street closure on March 28th um, on West 237th Street between Henry Hudson Parkway and Independence because they're going to have a boom truck there and they um, are going to ask that people move their cars. But that information will also be posted to the community board website as well as social media platforms. And the community is encouraged to go to those sites on a routine basis to check um, postings that are made. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the committee meeting minutes for the February 16 meeting. Um, I did share with the community, the committee members, um, a friendly amendment that was submitted to the uh, to me, um, and that we changed one of the words um, from projects to capital and expense from projects to requests, and the committee received copies of the revised minutes, and we will share this with the office at the appropriate time. Hey, Miriam. Yeah, and the uh, on the minutes that change. 239th Street to 238th Street by that intersection of Riverdale Avenue. Sure, thank you. Um, with those amendments, um, does any committee member have any objection to approving the minutes as requested, as presented? Motion to approve. Thank you. Okay, hearing no objection, the minutes are approved. Um, before we move on to the New York City DOT presentation, we have a few people in the gallery that may have some questions for DOT and rather than keeping them on the phone, I'm going to ask if the committee is okay if we um, move old business and new business um, up to the front of the calendar. Is that okay? Sure. Yep, I have no okay. issues. Anyone? Okay, thank you. Um, with that, then um, Lisa, I will turn it over to you and your colleagues at DOT. Thank you. for the presentation on the city bike um, expansion in the community. Great. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, give me just a sec. Um, there we go. Can everyone see the presentation here? Uh, yes. Yes. Thanks. Um, so my name is Lisa Morosco. I'm a senior planner on the bike share and shared mobility team here at DOT. Um, I'm here to give a very brief overview of like general information about the program um, that's expanding into the Bronx Community Board 8 uh, this year. Um, so first we're going to kind of go over some like general um, information about um, the city bike program, bike share program, um, and then we'll kind of go into uh, the planning process a little bit. Um, so bike share systems are a dense network of publicly shared bicycles really intended for short uh, one-way trips. Uh, they really help increase mobility around neighborhoods, giving people another option on how to get around. They complement existing transportation networks. Um, so buses, subways, ferries, 
uh, really acting as a first and last mile solution. They operate 24 seven, so users don't have to worry about storage and maintenance, uh, really making them uh, you know, reliable and convenient. Um, so City Bike is New York City's bike share program, uh, and it's the largest and most utilized uh, in the world outside of China. Uh, and this is a public-private partnership between the City of New York, uh, represented by DOT, and Lyft, the private uh, company which operates the system. New city funds are used to operate the program. Uh, it is a station-based uh, program, which means that it has dedicated space on the roadway or the sidewalk where users can access bikes. Uh, these, these stations are modular, solar-powered, so they don't require any trenching. Um, they also provide, you know, reliability, uh, consistency, uh, and redundancies for riders uh, accessing the program. Um, so the program launched about 10 years ago in, in May of 2013 with 330 stations, 6,000 bikes. Uh, in 2015, we began the phase two expansion, when, which more than doubled the, the program size uh, by the end of 2017. Um, our phase three expansion started in 2019. Um, and we're currently operating in all of Manhattan. Um, you know, we expanded further into Brooklyn and Queens, and we expanded into the Bronx uh, for the first time um, during that phase three. Um, so the program has been tremendously successful. We've seen over 170 million trips uh, since launch, uh, peak ridership months. We see over 100,000 uh, trips per day, and we have about 160,000 annual members. Um, we have a variety of membership options. Um, so we have casual, annual, and what we call a reduced fare. Um, so casual members come in two forms. We have the single ride, which is one 30-minute ride, and then a day pass, which includes unlimited 30-minute rides in a 24-hour period. Um, and then our most popular, which is our annual membership, uh, it is unlimited 45-minute rides um, in, you know, a, a year-long period. Um, and then we also do have the reduced fare uh, membership, which is available for uh, NYCHA residents and SNAP recipients. Uh, this is $5 a month. Um, and the annual, and it doesn't require an annual commitment um, like our annual memberships do. Um, these also have the 45 uh, unlimited rides as well. Um, a little bit about our equity efforts, our Reduce Fair Bike Share program is one. Um, we also do have a community grant program run by Lyft. Um, they're currently in the process of soliciting uh, grantees. Uh, so if you guys know of any community-based organizations that really target uh, minority or low-income um, folks, uh, I think, you know, it could, you know, that could benefit from either um, accessing the program, community rides, that sort of thing, we're happy to put them in touch um, so they can, you know, um, you know, apply for this grant. Um, and with that grant, they can get partner keys or free ride codes. Um, we also do have a board that helps us, uh, that guides really this like equity, uh, our equity and our, our policies around um, these efforts. Um, a little bit about DOT's um, safe cycling promotion. We do helmets, uh, light and cell giveaways. We also conduct safety awareness classes. Um, also wanted to highlight the fact that the kiosks and each one of the, the bikes that we have in the program um, have the sort of core rules of the road um, on all of them. As you can see in this lower, lower picture, uh, you can see that there's some of the um, those rules there. Um, so now we're going to go to a bit of our uh, planning process. Um, you know, we have four major steps um, that we look at. The first is going to be how we actually site the stations. And um, part of the success of this program has been the really dense network uh, that we create, um, making sure that we have equal access to the program um, whenever you're in the service area so that you're no more than a three to five minute walk. Um, station sizes are analyzed by the surrounding areas. So um, if you're in a commercial corridor at a transit hub, 
um, you're going to find that the stations might be a little bit larger, whereas like in a residential community, um, the stations might be a little bit smaller. Um, and so when identifying locations to place stations, we have a lot of factors to consider. Um, chief among them are, you know, proximity to hydrants, utilities, ADA, um, accessibility, pedestrian clearances on sidewalks, um, you know, among a variety of other factors. Um, a bit about our public outreach. Um, we do start with a, uh, our street ambassador team, which goes you know, out into the, out onto the streets. Um, we ask folks where they are, you know, where they might want to see a station or where they think a station uh, might not be great. Um, and we actually just launched our interactive station uh, maps in the Bronx areas for community board six and eight. You're going to see that in the um, lower portion. I'm kind of circling it here now. Um, essentially, what folks can do is we'll share this link. Um, you know, we can drop it in the chat, but we can also share it after the meeting. Um, but essentially, what people are going to be able to do is like drop a pin anywhere in this area. You can see a few pins dropped um, in this area here. Um, and what people are going to be able to do is say like, hey, you know, this is this might be a great area uh, for a station because there's a cultural hub or there's good transit access, et cetera. Um, and really the kind of information that we're looking for is, um, you know, like, hey, this is actually a really wide sidewalk or, um, you know, if, if there's particular challenges with like loading issues or, you know, double parking, um, that sort of thing. So like, we're not only looking for like, where's really great to put a station, but also like highlight the challenges that you guys have in your communities. Um, where a station might not benefit, um, but maybe like a block, a block south, like still accessing a particular like cultural amenity. So think, you know, a library or, um, you know, a grocery store, while it might not be right directly in front of this institution, you know, a block away, still providing great access, um, you know, those are the kind of details we're looking for. And so right now we're kind of doing our stakeholder um, blitz, if you will. Um, so we're just trying to solicit feedback and ask people, you know, where do you want these? Um, where not? Where might not be so great? Um, and what we end up doing with this information is great. Um, so if you can see in this top map here, I'm going to use Brooklyn as an example. Um, so this is a filled out um, feedback map. Um, so this highlights, you know, where people like nominated stations or they said this is not a great location for it. Um, and what we did is we created kind of like a heat map and you're going to see that in the second map here. Um, so that incorporated community feedback. Um, we overlaid it with, you know, some of our citing principles or guidelines also list, list operational considerations. Um, and then what we did is we used that to um, inform this draft plan map. Um, and then once we present this map to the community board, we post it online to make sure that it can be shared far and wide um, for everyone to see. Um, and in these last steps, what we do is after this draft plan is presented, um, we have about a month long feedback period. Um, and in conjunction with that like feedback period, we also do a lot of technical screenings and coordination. Um, what happens there is like we talk to our speaker agency. So let's say we want to put it adjacent to a park um, and we reach out to DPR and, you know, while it might look to us to be a great location, it might impact their, you know, operational, um, you know, maintenance and operational issues with, with that park. So it might not be a good location for them. So we, we try to sort of like sort out all of that, um, you know, during this period, um, we do notify all adjacent property owners. Um, from there, we end up install, installing stations. Um, and then from there, we do continue to like do additional outreach. We monitor um, and make adjustments where technically like feasible and where there are serious operational considerations. Um, that's sort of the, the gist of my presentation. This was more informational. We don't um, have any sites selected yet in, in CB8, but 
this is this is the period of time where we're asking folks um, to tell us where they want them, where they don't think they should be, um, so it can help really guide uh, this process um, when we're doing the site selection. Um, and so now I can kind of hand it back over if folks have questions about, about this process. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, can you please share the deck um, with the board office so we can distribute it to the community? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I see hands from um, member David Gelman, followed by um, Ms. Delera from Assemblyman Dinowitz's office. Uh, and thank then you. Deb, Deb Travis. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Alisa, I, I just wanted to check the city bikes are they one speed or three speed? Um, and will there be any? Um, uh, uh, pedal assist bikes. The reason why I ask is, as you may be aware, Riverdale is very hilly. I mean, doesn't bother me. My my, I won't use the city bike. I have my own bikes with lots and lots of gears. Um, but I think that the hills uh, um, uh, on the Riverdale Ridge and the Kingsbridge Heights Ridge, when you leave Broadway and Van Cortland, will be challenging for most. Yeah. So what I'd say is we do, so each one of the bikes, if they are what we call our classic bikes, those do have three different speeds to them. Um, so obviously like if you're on a hill, you wanna shift down to make it easier to get up the hill. Um, but we also do have, you know, a certain percentage of the suite uh, is gonna be e-bikes. Um, and so what ends up happening is like, we don't, you know, the, the e-bikes kind of float around the system as do the classic bikes. Um, so they're gonna go where people are taking them. Um, but we do have overnight like rebalancing. So we do some sort of shifting. So if we find that like in a certain area, you know, people are, you know, taking it to a transit hub in the morning and then taking it away at night, um, there's gonna be some additional rebalancing efforts there. Um, but what you're going to find is that like there's going to ideally in a perfect world, there's going to be like an even spread of classic um, and e-bikes throughout the, the service area. Have the e-bikes been tested on hills as steep as Riverdale and Kingsbridge Heights? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't like I don't have a like a good comparison of like exactly those first of all like Riverdale we're not expanding to Riverdale um so just kind of wanted to flag that um for for the board um but you know we do operate in hilly areas Harlem specifically is pretty hilly um they operate really great if you've ever been on any bridge in New York City, they operate really great um, in those areas as well. So essentially like the pedal assist, if you're not familiar, just to give people a, a general background, um, you're gonna have to pedal your bike, um, but it's gonna give you a little bit of a boost. Um, so it's gonna make it, um, it's gonna make a ride a lot more enjoy enjoyable um, with, with the pedal assist um, and they do cap out at um, I believe 20 miles per hour. So you're not gonna go, like it's not gonna be super fast. Um, they do cap out and you really have to be aggressive um, if you wanna even hit that um, mark as well. Uh, okay, just real quick. I mean, I, I've biked the, the Harlem Hill in Central Park many mm -hmm. times, but I would encourage you to take an e-bike um, uh, and uh, uh, from Broadway and bike up to Wave Hill and then take it again and bike up to the Jerome Park Reservoir. Those are two very steep hills that I, I think people likely would take from your Broadway Van Cortland Park locations. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lehrer, before you begin, um, Lisa, you mentioned that you will not be putting any bike in Riverdale. What is the rationale for that? Um, we just have a, a general border. So we, you know, when we've recreated these borders with, um, you know, several different stakeholders and like Riverdale was just not, um, not on the phase three expansion area. We can share those uh, boundaries with you, but it, it's not gonna be, um, we're not going to Riverdale. 
Okay, can you please share the boundaries with us, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, if I can just add, if the community board would like to advocate for us to expand in the future, we're more than happy to take that information and um, let uh, LIFT know. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lara and then Deb Travis, followed by um, Mr. Jack Mark. Thank you very much, and please uh, call me Jesse. Uh, we're all we're all neighbors here. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, what is an example of a common adjustment, and from the time of feedback to completion of that those adjustments, uh, typically how long does that take? Um, great question. So a lot of times, you know, if uh, when we do make adjustments, um, a lot of times they are in direct response to, let's say, there's um, right now actually we're expanding into Queens, and um, there's a a resident of a building that needs special access. Uh, they have a handicap, um, so they need you know special vehicles to you know go to their job, et cetera. Um, and so right now we're making accommodations to the station to make it easier for them or make sure that they still have access to these vehicles um, when they need them. Um, so those are the types of, of, of you know, responses that we have. Or let's say that there's a, you know, a particular uh, building that has, we didn't notice like trash um, pickup, like a particularly large trash pickup. Um, we might help adjust uh, a station configuration to make it easier for, for those types of things. Um, but those are generally things that we try to, I mean, obviously, like, you know, somebody who is disabled in an adjacent building, we can't always identify that, but trash pickup, we always try to look for um, certain things like that. So those are the, the general type of things that, like, we make accommodations for um, once stations go down. Uh, thank and you. It's a time the creative range. can be um, anywhere from, you know, like whenever they notify us um, and then whenever we can fit it into the schedule. Um, ideally, you know, if it's something critical, like, you know, somebody who needs access to vehicles, we try to, you know, make that happen as fast as possible. Um, or if it's like a critical operational thing, we again, we try to make it as, as, as quickly as possible, but it just depends on the level of adjustment. Um, we might need to like have another survey. Um, so it can, any, and it can take anywhere from two to four weeks. Um, and that's like the quickest we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Deb Travis. Um, thank you, um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about um, a couple of the boundaries. Uh, it looked like the um, current area stops at Broadway, and I was wondering if it would be safe to say that there would likely be bikes um, at the train stations, so that, um, that just because they're transit hubs, um, I wasn't sure if you, you intended to actually uh, have bikes on Broadway at the train stations. Um, so, yeah, I think we, you know, a core um, goal of the program is to really complement in existing infrastructure. It's to provide additional access to those, um, you know, first and last mile um, accommodations. And so while we might not be able to put a station, you know, directly adjacent to a subway entrance, what we're trying to do is get people as close as possible to those. Um, so even if, let's say, you know, some of this community feedback um, we get, you know, overwhelming, you know, positive feedback for a particular intersection. And we've looked at this and for whatever reason, we can't put a place like a station at that intersection. We're going to try to get it as close as possible. Um, so just because, you know, it, it like in theory makes the most sense and would be super logical. If it doesn't make sense on the ground, we're not going to put a station there, but we're going to try to accommodate it as best as we can by putting it in close proximity. Um, okay, yeah, no, that, that, answers, that answers that question. And then um, I wanted to just ask about Van Cortlandt Park because it looked like kind of the boundaries went around the park, but I assume, is it safe to say that there would be stations that we can t take these city bikes to the park? So they're going to be around Van Cortlandt Park. Um, you can certainly take the bikes into the park. 
you're going to have that cap of 30 to 45 minutes um, once you take them out. Um, yeah. If you do take them out longer than the 30 to 45 minute um, increment period, you're going to have an overage fee. Um, but what I'd say is if you, during that like 30 to 45 minute period, if you take a bike, dock it back at a station, you have to wait a couple of minutes. I think, I think it's like two to three minutes. Um, and then you can take a bike out again. Um, and so really the, the only reason for these time limits um, on the bikes is to really um, facilitate it for like transportation. Um, you know, while we do want people to use them as recreation and I think COVID has like, you know, changed the dynamic in some way of folks using this program, what we find is the vast majority of rides are used for um, transportation and connecting. Most rides are under 15 minutes. Um, so recreational rides are like far and away, like, you know, the definitely not uh, the majority of rides that we find in the program. Yeah, and I, and I just wanna say just to, in terms of like talking about city bike as a whole, um, I use city bike all the time myself um, for when I, you know, ride, take the subway to someplace kind of close to where I need to go, or if the, there's a line that's not running, I can take something else and then take the city bike across. And I've had it cut like 45 minutes off of my time on the weekends and stuff when you have to wait a long time between trains. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan. And so I just, uh, I think it'll be really great up around the reservoir because we're between the four and the B and the D and the one. And so it, uh, and it allows us to then kind of come up the hill from any of these trains. And so it's gonna just open up um, just transportation options, which I think is gonna be really great. So I'm, I'm totally very excited to have, a, have this come into, the, into our neighborhood finally been waiting. Um, and I just want to say one last piece, which is that, 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 that what one last thing, Wave Hill. I think we, like I, I, I hope we expand into Wave Hill or into Riverdale, but I think Wave Hill, um, who already run a shuttle from Van Cortlandt Park up, would be well served if had they had docks nearby. So that's it. Thank you, um, Jack Moore, please. Hi, uh, I apologize for leaving my camera off. I'm a little bit under the weather, but. Um, I, I'm at a disadvantage because, but maybe what Deb just said, I don't know if the boundaries include Van Cortland Village and Kingsbridge Heights, where both of us live. Um, and, um, but hopefully that it does include that as Deb just made the point. And there are, you know, one of the things I'll say is there, we have many daylighted corners that are no standing or ready. And I've seen, daylighted corners in other neighborhoods where stations have been placed. And I think that would be great because it would uh, eliminate the placard abuse that is rampant in our community and unenforced by anybody. So if there's a station there, the placard abusers won't be able to use the space anymore. And along Sedgwick, there are, um, I don't know what you call them, but there is already white lined, um, uh, markers on the from the curb you know a good car length out that could have stations without taking any parking away because there's there's already uh markers uh eliminating parking there um so i am a, i'm i've used city bike uh when i traveled to other uh neighborhoods in manhattan and brooklyn uh and it, it is i am jealous of the infrastructure those boroughs have compared to the Bronx. So um, I highly endorse this and hope that it includes uh, my community, Van Cortlandt Village, Kingsbridge Heights. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think you're right. I think that's such a great example, um, you know, of where we can implement this infrastructure um, and kind of meet other community needs, you know, so one of the things we find is like, you know, parking, you know, parking lots um, or, you know, repurposed parking is a, a pretty big issue in a lot of communities that we expand into. And one of the, the techniques that we use to help minimize that is going into these daylighting intersections that you, you mentioned. Um, so if you can highlight those places. Um, specifically on this map, even if you don't want to do it on this map, if you want to, you know, give it to us in a different way, happy to take that information 
um, that way as well. Um, and if we're talking about uh, just kind of wanted to give folks a little bit of, of better information, um, the, the boundaries, the most um, Western yeah. boundary is going to be Irving Avenue. Yeah. Um, I'm on a phone and call. So basically that it's going to kind of cut down there. Um, and then it's kind of cut over to where kind of like Terrace view is almost because um, it like turns into Johnson, um, but it kind of like cuts back over. And again, we can share that information with the board, but just to give you guys a heads up of what, what area we're talking about um, now. Thank you. Ro Rosemary Ginty. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, one comment and two questions. I'll fit in my two minutes. The comment is, thank you very much for asking for the map of the boundaries. It's clear some people on this meeting are aware of what the boundaries are now. I can tell you I'm not. I think some members, other members are not aware. And certainly the community at large is not aware what the boundaries are. So asking for them is great. Thank you. Number two, just if you would just consider the widest intelligent dissemination of that information for public purposes would be great. Whatever that dissemination is, do consider uh, that that's one of the one of the goals. Okay. Now my two questions. Let me just thank ask them so I make my two minutes. Okay. <laughs> no said, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, number one, at the beginning, I think I heard you correctly. You said the city now uh, uh, puts money into this program. Correct. No. Oh, I thought you said the city pays for it. No. There's no city money in this. There's no city money. Nope. Yeah, excellent. Okay. I misunderstood your comment. Thank you. I'm very good. glad I asked that uh, because it started no city money. And when I heard, okay, great. Okay. So, so the next question is, um, uh, are there areas in, as you design this, areas that are forbidden? Under no circumstances will you put uh, bikes in 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 certain areas, and I ask for for this reason, and not just to address these two, but for this reason. Um, you mentioned oh, adjacent to parks, are parks themselves forbidden? Would you ever consider putting these inside parkland? Number two, you mentioned interesting libraries. Many, libra many libraries have land adjacent to them. Uh, you say adjacent to libraries is putting them on library property not doable for you. Uh, uh, Deb just mentioned uh, Wave Hill. As a cultural institution, it is mapped parkland. Um, so you, you get, and, and, and please just don't address the parks or libraries. Are there areas that you, under no circumstances, will consider it's off the table for, for bikes? Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Lisa, please. Thanks, Rosemary. Those were all really great questions. And so to kind of like get to the general um, gist of it, so we certainly want to place stations you know, near libraries, libraries love having city bike stations next to them um, or parks, um, but we will, will not play stations that don't have 24 seven access. Um, so that is one of the critical technical criteria that we have. So we won't put a station inside of a park, but we certainly would put a station on the verge of a park. Um, and we've done that throughout the city and we put them on the verges of parks where it doesn't interfere with park operations. Um, and so usually, yeah. Um, and so usually that takes a, a secondary level of like, you know, coordination, um, you know, but like certainly we wouldn't place it inside of one because it isn't accessible 24 seven. Now, if the library has property that they're willing uh, to host a station that can be accessible. We certainly have stations on like what is potentially considered private property or not like city public right of way, which is where we can, you know, city bike can like, usually that's sort of our standard. We have it in the public right of way. Um, but we, we do make special agreements with some organizations, but it does require 24 seven access to these sites. Um, so that is a critical um, component of site selection. 
I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Kelly, can we ask her to put the map of the boundaries back up? It seems like people miss that. Sure. So what I'm going to do, let me actually share the um, the feedback map, and that actually has the boundaries on right. it. I'm going to put that in the chat, um, but then I can share it on on my screen if folks would like as there, well. There's no there's, there's no, no chat. chat, so you would have to share it on the screen. Oh, okay. So give me okay. one. Let yeah, I was going to share it in the chat and then I realized there was no chat, um, but we're also going to share the link with the community board after this meeting so that you guys can share share it so anybody who wants to pin a site can do so. Okay, can everyone see my screen here? Yes. Okay, so this is the area that we're talking about. Um, so this is what I was talking about, you know, Irwin Avenue, um, you know, Van Portland Park is going to be our most northern border. Um, followed by um, Gold. Oh. So, and so these these right here are um, where folks have already dropped comments in. So so far we have about sixty four comments here. Um, but as I mentioned, we're also um, expanding, you know, into CV uh, six as well. Um, and what I'd say is like you know because the Bronx is Obviously, like most rides are under 15 minutes. So we find that communities are super connected. Um, so we want to make sure that like, we don't want to exclude anyone who wants to drop a comment in CV8. We don't want, we want them also to comment on CV6 um, if they have, you know, places that are good destinations, maybe they work over there, maybe they visit people over there. Um, so we want to make sure that folks have, have options uh, to make comments as well. Okay, thank you. and. You ha do you have a portal or something that individuals can use for this? So this is the portal. Um, the I'm showing. Um, what we're going to go ahead and do um, is we're going to share the link to this right after the meeting um, because we can't share it here in a chat. Um, okay. And so that we can go in and, and drop comments, you know, wherever they want um, in this in this boundary here. Okay. And and what is the typical rollout time for this project? Uh, um, so we are planning uh, to present to the board um, in May or June, um, and then that will give from May or June. We're going to have about a month long feedback period, um, you know, where we, you know, incorporate like any issues. Um, so, you know, afterwards we present the plan. You guys have issues we'll try to work with you on how to make any adjustments um, that might need to happen we'll then again share this like what we call our updated plan um, and then with that updated plan we're going to do um, more technical screening and so sometimes even if we do present this like updated plan um, let's say we get on the ground and all of a sudden a construction project um, is in the way we'll have to find like a uh, you know, alternate location, you know, a, a temporary relocation is what we call them, um, you know, nearby, or, you know, let's say for whatever reason, um, you know, a tree pit gets expanded, which has been happening more and more recently. Um, tree pits are, are getting wider. Um, it might make a site that's on the sidewalk um, not viable anymore. So there's a variety of factors like uh, that can happen between the draft and updated and when things go on the ground. Um, that can happen. It's a pretty small percentage of stations, but it does happen um, pretty regularly throughout the expansion area, is what I'd say. Um, but we're hoping after we um, present the draft plan, we get a month long feedback, we do the updated plan, um, maybe like one to two months after that, um, we'll begin to start implementing. Um, so once we actually give you the draft plan, um, it'll probably be about like three to three to four months. Uh, after that, we'll be implementing in the neighborhood, but we can continue to give you updates on, you know, when we plan to install, um, you know, we've experienced throughout the years a variety of issues potentially with, you know, supply chain or, or other factors that might delay an expansion. So we'll always keep the board updated on, you know, any updated timelines here. Thank you, Dan Patternett followed by Jody Cologne, followed by David Gilman. Hi, Lisa, thank you for the presentation. Um, 
I think we've certainly heard some remarks and, and I think Jack Martha made it, made the point earlier, you know, parking is at a premium. So to the extent you can do it in daylighting areas, I think that's very good and off street not to take parking spots. Um, I, I do have a question about the process that you just kind of laid out to make sure, you know, what's important to me is community uh, engagement here. Um, and knowing that the community board is not going to have, or, or we don't usually have session in July and August. So that's two months, you know, that, that we're not really here. So assuming, you know, and again, I'm just trying to figure out the draft plan, what's gonna be the timing? And I'm just trying to figure that out. If you come out in May, are we getting the draft plan at the community board, you know, a few weeks before say the traffic meeting where folks can kind of look at, look at it beforehand? Are you gonna present it at the meeting and say, hey, this is our draft plan? I'm trying to work that like tonight, for instance, we didn't receive a deck beforehand. So we're just kind of learning this information for the first time, most of us. So what is that plan? Because what I, you know, the way we operate here, it's essentially traffic meeting. Folks like to kind of investigate, check it out. We come back and say, okay, let's, let's talk about what we saw the following month and then our board then reviews it. So we're really looking at a 45 to 60 day period here, the way we kind of operate um, in, in the committee. So again, I'm just trying to fit in if that's May and then June, how are we then gonna get updates on whatever that updated plan is? Are you then coming back to us with the updated plan? Then I'm trying to fit it into our schedule as well so that way we can get as much community input as possible. Oh, no, I, I totally agree and I, and I get what you're saying. Um, and I think that's why we um, are aiming to get the draft plan um, like to the board by um, at least May. Um, but it could be June, just depending on how um, things are shaking out in like the other areas of, of the program. Um, so if we come to you guys in May, that's like a month long feedback period. Um, so you, from there, you're gonna have, like we're not gonna share the deck with you before the meeting. We're gonna share like all of the locations with you on the day of the presentation. And from there becomes like that 30 day like feedback period. So I guess that's my concern, Lisa, because it really doesn't fit into how we operate here at the community board. If we're learning for it the first time, say May 18th, when our May meeting is, for us to then go out, you know, that after that meeting to go check out the sites, give you input, you know, we're coming back in June at our traffic meeting. The next time the board will meet after that isn't going to be until September. And it's our board that needs to speak. Um, um, Dan, the last board meeting is actually the last week of June because they've moved it all the way to the end of June for, for the board meeting, just FYI. There won't be an exact, uh, but there'll be a, a board meeting. Okay, I didn't receive that information from our board chair yet. Yeah, we've been, if that's the case, yeah. maybe exec heard that. I'm, I don't know. I didn't catch that information. But I guess the 30-day period, even in that case, and thank you, Deb, would still turn into a 45-day period for us. Because if we're moving it to the end of June, you know, traffic then comes back, you know, sometime mid June, and then we would have the benefit of the end of June, assuming that's the case. But it would still be outside of your 30 day period. Yeah. And so again, the way we operate, the way we operate is that, you know, it's the board that speaks. I think we can work with that, right? If you guys are, it's like the last date that you guys are meeting is like the end of June that can be sort of like the deadline that we can try to like work towards, right? And like work back from it to say, mm -hmm. okay, like if you guys are meeting at the end of June, we're gonna aim to get to you guys uh, by May. Um, and if for whatever reason, anything changes, we can certainly get, keep you guys in the loop of any scheduling changes that might happen um, after that. But like that information is really mm -hmm. great too for us to try yeah, to get so, to you. And then coming back with your updated plan, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's sometime in September. Um, and then how much time would we have to comment on the updated plan? Um, the updated plan, I mean, you guys can comment on it, but usually um, unless it's barring any, you know, serious operational issues, like between the draft plan and like the updated plan, like that is when the comment period is to give, give us any like issues um, and that's why I'm sort of like also highlighting, mm -hmm. tell us like where, where it's critical not to put stations versus like mm -hmm. where it's critical, like to have, you know, good adjacent gotcha. stations. And if we propose those, you can give us like really great alternatives 
um, that we can have for those. Um, but after the updated plan, um, you know, unless there's like a really serious operational issue, um, mm -hmm. you know. Understood. It's like your final plan at that point. Understood. So I, I guess now just kind of getting into nitty gritty, how many locations are you looking for? Or slash bikes, you know, do you have, hey, we want to put 100 bikes in CB8, we want to put 10 stations in CB8, do you guys have that? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to be more than 10 stations. Um, we don't have like the exact number yet, we're still kind of like fleshing out. Um, so a lot of times we have that, like if you saw that one slide where we have the grids overlaid, um, we do that throughout the city and the idea is to put one fish in each one of those grids. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, mm -hmm. So we're still going through that process of like, you know, what makes actual sense to put a station um, and where doesn't it? So we can come back to you with those like, like overall numbers of what yep. we, we can go on CDA. So I've also seen stations of different size. How many bikes per station are you looking to get here? Um, so our average station sizes in this area is going to be more like 22 station, 22 docks, like per station. 22 docks. Um, and to give you um, a little bit of like a guide, um, you know, stations in the core of Manhattan, you're looking at station sizes that average 50 docks. Um, so these are like much smaller um, like more reflective of like community areas. I think the larger stations are going to probably be like around 30 to 40 docks. And those are going to be closer to like transit hubs, um, places where you're going to find a lot of people trying to get to. Um, but we also want to make sure that like once people, um, you know, are getting home and want to get home, they're going to have a station, you know, close by yeah. um, to where they Okay. And and I apologize, it's the size of it. So if we're looking for a place, how big is a 22 dock station? How many 20, feet? So our smallest station um, is going to be around 50 to 60 feet, depending on whether or not it's going to be in the street or the sidewalk. Um, so the sidewalk stations can be a little bit smaller. Um, and the stations on the streets are just like a tad bit uh, larger than sidewalk stations because you have a little bit of like buffer. Um, on each side to help with like to fill, facilitate maintenance, um, like cleaning the station, bikes, et cetera. But locations 50 to 60 feet are what we're looking for. Understood, thank you. And I, I apologize, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Jody Colon. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, I did miss the, the first few minutes, so apologies if you address this, but you've mentioned technical criteria. Um, I did Google, found the map earlier, um, but I couldn't find the criteria for evaluating the site. So if you could share that, that's my first thing. And then the second thing is, is I had looked at the map and um, indeed, this is the first time that the community is hearing about it, that it was on the agenda. I reached out to groups in some of the neighborhoods and blocks where people have suggested sites. Um, and nobody's heard of this coming to our community board before. So the community outreach piece is going to be um, very important. How much consideration is given to the fact that a community person put it on the map? Um, we've had some not happy circumstances where one person requested something and it was it was considered a stamp of approval by the community and those became problematic um, issues. So, so aspirational versus actual and how your technical criteria play into that, that someone's requested a spot, but it's not really a great spot. How do you evaluate that? Um, you know, like all, all great questions. So if you know, you know, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, but if, if a particular intersection um, is highlighted by the community um, and for whatever reason, there's no technical, technically viable options. Um, and so what I mean by technically viable options, there are like several factors that go, like factors that go into like considering whether a site is viable or not. Um, so we need to make sure that we have you know, ADA clearance if it's on the sidewalk, so clear pedestrian paths. Um, if it's in the road bed, we need to make sure that it's not, you know, it can't be in a bus stop. It can't be, you know, next to a hydrant and has to be a, a certain distance from those. If there's utilities in the road bed, it can't be on top of those utilities. Um, also, 
other considerations for sidewalks. You know, let's say that there's like a lot of tree pits on a particular street. Um, you know, while we can sort of bridge the the, the equipment is somewhat flexible, um, but we have a lot of like you know certain requirements. Um, you know, very specific to how the equipment can kind of like fit into the existing streetscape. Um, and so we're happy to like evaluate that um, on a case by case basis. And while you know, one location might look very similar to another. And while one might work, the other one might not work for like a variety of reasons. Um, so like a lot of stations are just case by case basis. So certainly even if community members are like demanding a station at a particular location, if, if it just doesn't meet the technical requirements, if there's too many curb cuts, if there's a bus stop and hydrants, et cetera, um, at that intersection, we're not going to place it there, um, but we're going to try to get it as close as possible um, to that particular location. Um, and even if, you know, we, we do place the station there um, and we present it to the board, um, you know, you guys can also say, like, actually, hey, like, there's a lot of issues at this particular intersection with, like, you know, double parking and loading or like whatever the issue, like maybe there's like speeding cars or like what, whatever the issues that you, you have um, to that particular intersection, we're happy to listen to them and make slight adjustments to the placement um, in that particular area. Um, so the draft plan, like once we present it, that's a really great opportunity for you to like help us sort of like tweak and refine um, our plan to make sure it fits the best it can um, in our communities. Great, thank you. And actually, that was why I was like, oh, that site's a loading, just a new loading space. They just asked for bikes there. Um, so you must have seen that. So thank you very much. And then are these criteria, uh, I couldn't find them on the website. Are those online? Uh, we don't have them online per se. Like we don't have like our explicit um, requirements. Um, but what we can do is give you an example of like a plat, a past draft plan um, in the Bronx. And at the end of the presentation, um, there's sort of like a visual guide um, that kind of gives you a general um, like outline of you know some of the siting criteria. So we'll share that. Um, you know, dr previous draft plan with you. And then the very last slide is basically going to be um, some of our, our site, our site considerations. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly, for the extra time. Thank you, Judy. No worries. David Gilman, followed by Michael Amabile. Uh, yes, uh, a quick question. I, I agree uh, with uh, Jack, the idea of uh, uh, trying to use the uh, daylit um, uh, intersections as well as around um, cross um, crosswalks um, for uh, this to minimize the loss of parking. My question for you, though, then is what kind of conversations have you had with the disabled community about uh, how the bikes and or the docks themselves might interfere with their ability to see the, the traffic in the street as they try to come out uh, from um, the the, the uh, docks uh, in, through the crosswalks. And so we do have a buffer between sites. Like we won't we won't place a station in a, in a crosswalk, right? And um, so we do have certain buffers um, from dock crosswalks or ped cuts, um, even driveways, um, to make sure that like we there's clear access to those. Um, not only that, obviously, like if the station's on a, a sidewalk, um, we make sure that we meet all ADA clearance requirements. Um, and further, like the example that I gave of this like Queens um, site that I was talking about, um, technically we haven't in installed the station, um, but when we notified the property owners, they were like, hey, actually, there might be this issue with a particular resident who has, you know, um, who is wheelchair bound, who needs access to special vehicles. And so we're in the process right now of working with them to adjust the station configuration to make sure that they still have, you know, access to vehicles um, as well. Um, so we certainly like where feasible, really try to work with people, um, you know, that have that. But in general, we meet all ADA requirements before the stations even go on the ground. But, th but this is not an ADA requirement. The sight lines, when you're 30 inches off the ground, you may not be able to see beyond the bicycles or the docks. 
as to traffic that's coming. That's what I'm referring to. Not the the ground way to to wheel, but rather can you see oncoming traffic because of the bikes or the dock stations? So the like the sight lines are are permeable, whether or not there are bikes in the station or not. Um, so you can kind of like see through the stations. And what I'd say is like if when the stations are on the street, there are we do have structures, what we call like um, flexible delineators around the station. So if somebody was, you know, walking with, you know, like one, you're going to see that vertical element before you even hit a wheel, anything like that. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, even using, you know, using a stick, you'd be able to like hit any sort of element of the station before you ran, like before, somebody wouldn't just like run into it if they were using that. Um, but it is visually like you can see it. Um, they can also hit it with their um, sticks as well. I'm not sure if you have any additional questions there. I, I don't think you understand my question. Maybe we can talk another time. Perhaps, yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lisa. Michael? Hi, thanks very much. Uh, apologies, I did miss the first few uh, seconds of your presentation, so um, you may have answered this, but um, could you talk a little bit more about the, uh, not the sighting criteria, but the, um, the extents of the boundaries and the criteria that went into choosing where to mm -hmm kind of delineate this section of CB8 or this section, you know, or the section of CB6, but obviously in this case, CB8. Um, I just think it's very unfortunate that uh, this didn't include more parts of, of Riverdale or Spite and Dival considering the elevation and grade changes. Um, and that similarly that exists on the Kingsbridge Heights side towards the Sedgwick side of the community, but not necessarily up the hill the other way towards the West. And if you could talk a little bit more about why that was excluded um, from this expansion? Sure. Um, I think, you know, like as, as somebody who helped plan this, like I would have loved to go everywhere <laughs> in CP8. Um, but we did have a, a finite number of, you know, docks um, and bikes that were going to be expanded throughout what we called the phase three area. Um, and so when we were looking at sort of the larger outer boundaries, um, we really tried to I identify like existing, um, you know, things that like made the most sense. So whether it was like a significant grade change, like if it made sense to use that as a boundary, um, we, we did that in certain cases. So like Mashaloo Parkway um, really made sense that the park in Portland um, made a whole lot of sense for us to use that sort of as like a larger boundary. Um, you know, I think what also would be really critical is you know, to hear like that you want to get it into these like areas just outside of the expansion that we have already planned. Um, so we had, uh, again, like it was a limited amount of equipment. We had a lot of area to cover. Um, we wanted to get as far as we could into the Bronx um, without actually um, interfering with the additional expansion into Queens um, as well as Brooklyn. Um, you know, we had you know, additional space in Manhattan to consider as well. Um, but I think for us, like hearing, hearing the voices of saying like, we actually do want it here would be really great. I think, you know. Um, so let me just jump uh, on that. So, so are, are you saying that, that that other part of the community board was asking for it and that other, and that this part of the community board wasn't asking for it? Because I guess my point is there, there is a pretty clear elevation delineation on the west side and you didn't necessarily use that grade change to delineate there. I mean, I'm happy if you're like, well, we actually did the census data and we were there was an equity lens that was applied or there was a car ownership lens that was applied. Any of that stuff would also be helpful to hear as opposed to like just, it was a grade change because there's a pretty strong grade change east of Bailey. I mean, obviously a grade change isn't exclusively what we used. Um, of course, we used census data, like we used a whole lot yeah, of other data um, to help inform um, like trip generations and where we thought, yeah, yeah. you know, the core of the system should stay. And like one of the critical components of like making sure this system as we expand out continues to operate 
um, in the most the best way that it can is to make sure that the the borders are as contiguous like it's it's tight. We want to make sure you know that we don't have any like valleys or like you don't want to make you want to make sure that it's like a very tight border like as you're expanding out. Um, and so that's part of like why we chose some of those boundaries um, to make sure that they like hit critical like cultural amenities. So like we really wanted to make sure we hit Van Portland Park um, because we knew people were going to want to use the bikes um, in these areas. We wanted to make sure um, that we were getting um, to other critical like areas of the Bronx. Um, but there were just like it's just a function of the limited equipment that we had. Um, and of course, like we do have um, some, you know, supplemental uh, equipment. So like there are certain areas where we could potentially just like kick a border out here or there um, if the community wants it, which is why I'm sort of reiterating. If you guys think that there's an opportunity missed here, like we can consider some additional space here, but we need to hear that. Um, from the community, and it's going to really be community driven. Um, so yeah. if you guys think that there's spaces that we've missed, like, please advocate uh, for that. Yeah, I will. I'll just last point, Madam Chair, if I can just one last thing. I just think. Sure, it's, please. It's a, 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 please. I will. Missed, missed, oppor missed opportunity. First mile, first mile, last mile connection at the end of the one train. And also, as anyone on this call or anywhere in the community board would tell you, Yes, you've touched Van Cortland Park, but Van Cortland Park is huge, and there are so many people who access it further up near the Tortoise yeah. and Hare or even further north still, and you guys have invested so much in the bike lanes all along Van Cortland Park that, again, I think a real missed opportunity to, to expand the service. I know you're not going to get any buy-in maybe up in Fieldston, per se, but to have some stations further north along Broadway is, I think, a, you know, a little short-sighted. Um, to be frank, but I appreciate the effort and thank you very much for being here and thank you for the extra time, Madam Chair. You're welcome, my pleasure. Um, Dan Patternath. Well, I'm sorry. Just very quickly, I, I, I know it's been touched on here and I won't you know, go into the, the Riverdale part of it, though that, that is probably the biggest transit desert that we have in, in Community Board Aid in Riverdale. And I think what we're going to see practically is folks getting bikes in Kingsbridge and driving them up to Riverdale. So how do you guys deal with the bikes that are just left in Riverdale with no docks? And I know you guys have a um, program to do it. How would it work here? So we, we're not going to Riverdale, um, just to highlight Oh, that. you're not, um, but bikes are going to end no. up there. They, I mean, like, sure, like bikes might, people might, bikes out of the system but like those are going to be bikes that are potentially like either you know vandalized so those are not going to be like active riders like you have to dock a bike at the end of the trip which the station it makes it like much less vulnerable um to theft again theft happens and like bikes are gonna end up stolen um in places there are uh, certainly, um, you know, you can reach out. We have DOT has like a dedicated like bike share email address um, that you can certainly reach out to um, on each one of the kiosks. Um, there's a, like a 1-800 number uh, and there's also like a, a web form that you can fill out mm -hmm. uh, on the, the website if you find a bike um, that is sort of, you know, abandoned somewhere. And we have a recovery team um, on the lift side that will go out and, and find those and collect them and bring them back into the system. So if, if that does happen and you're finding it a particular issue, we're certainly happy to like work with you guys on like how to like manage that. Yeah. Um, but there are certain processes in place already. And what's the lift response time for that? We call in a complaint from the CB that uh -huh. there's a, an abandoned bike. It, it varies. It varies depend on, depending on where it is because oftentimes where we tell them where it is, is not where it ends up. Um, and the bikes, um, not all of the bikes have GPS on them. Um, so if a bike gets moved, it's really hard to find them afterwards, um, unless the team is just like scouring. So um, it, like I said, it just varies um, based, on, based on what they can find. Excellent, thank you, I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Holly? 
uh, uh, um, and Lisa and the DOT team on this subject. Okay. Hearing nothing, then um, we can move on. And thank you, Lisa. Um, great presentation. Look forward to receiving the requested materials and the links so people can um, start providing their input. Um, sure, and just so. sure, go um, ahead, Lisa. Sorry, just to confirm so I don't miss anything. Um, what we're going to do is send over the um, feedback map, which is going to have the boundary, um, you know, of the, the service area in CV8. So we're going to send over that link. We're going to send over a previous, um, you know, draft plan presentation, which is going to have the additional criteria for um, citing some of those like larger considerations. Um, those are the two primary things. Am I missing anything? And the deck you presented this evening. Okay. I, can I, I just wanted to flag that I, I already shared the link. Um, I reshared it with you and also um, uh, with Laura. Um, so okay. you guys can share that as soon as possible as we're really excited to get any feedback that you have. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Teresa. And I'll just add that the presentation that I gave tonight, what I'll go ahead and do is when I share it, I'm just going to add in that extra slide that I was talking about. That way the presentation has everything that you need and then we'll share that the link is also embedded in the presentation as well um, so you'll have everything hopefully in this presentation that i share okay perfect thank you much appreciate it um, moving on then to old business so Thanks. Teresa, lisa and team there is an intersection um in the the community district um van Cortland avenue West and Sedgwick Avenue. DOT has done a lot of enhancements to that intersection. And unfortunately, um, the enhancements seem to have created more problems than they resolved. So how can we um, work with you to have someone come out, do a new study of that area and make changes? It seems every, I'll say couple of months, um, the flexible delineators are being replaced because you know there's the intersection is not clear at all so people don't understand how the flow of traffic is supposed to go and it's really creating a problem um so i'm going to let lisa go um so I just and just in case cuz i didn't introduce myself in the beginning i am Teresa cruz from the bronx borough commissioner's office for new york city dot um, I know that there has been a history with this location, so I'm going to bring this back to our interim Bronx Borough Commissioner Keith and see how he wants to proceed. As of right now, if you want to send us an email, I can at least agree to a site visit so that I can understand some of the concerns here. Um, but like I said, I know that there is a history, so I will speak to Keith about it. But if you can start with sending us an email, we can we can go from there. Okay. Um, thank you. My next question. Um, it relates to the car share locations. I noticed that you all yesterday provided us with updated car share locations. Um, and three of the four, even though your communication indicated there were nine, but at the meeting, the November meeting, you only really presented four. Um, three of those locations were um, included and those locations are 3536 Cambridge, Cambridge, 4652 Manhattan College Parkway and 3600 Irwin Avenue. You have since added um, 690 West 227 and 3100 Kingsbridge Terrace. And can you please advise um, how those determinations were made? So I apologize because I wasn't prepared to answer these questions. So I can get back to our car share team and see um, how we determined the additional two sites. Um, and just to confirm, it's 690 West 227th Street. And what was the other location? 3100 Kingsbridge Terrace. Okay, I'll go ahead and follow up with them and then I can get back to you. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, caller, um, whose last four digits are 2216, you have a question? Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Jim Wacker. I was at the meeting two months ago and uh, we would, I just wanted to follow up on what's going on with the pedestrian walk next to Bruss Park. Hello? Mr. Wacker? Oh, hello. 
Um, we will um, research. We I thought we had resolved that the night of the meeting, so we will we can pull uh, up I, that I, information. I, and I and think we were trying to find out what what the the builders. Uh, building plan was the last time I heard. Of, of course, it seems to me the building <laughs> that should have been nailed down before they started building, but it wasn't. Nobody could find one at that point. And I still want, would like to know what is going to happen with that uh, 242nd Street little bit there, the city okay. street. We will um, look into it and, and have someone get back to you, okay? Okay, is it is it possible to get an email or something? Because they could just pay Did over you, that whole thing at at any moment, and uh, then we'd be we'd have to tear up the you know it'd be a lot more work. So, um, I see if you, Jody. If you find out anything, I would like to hear it, and the the, the, the save the save the Bruss Park movement would like to hear it too. Okay, thank you, Jody Cologne. Do you have um, a comment? No, no, not for Jim's request. I'm just, are we doing old business now before yes. budget? Yes, you okay. were not at the top of the call. So yes, yes. we like to old business and then we're coming back to the other thing because we, we are mindful that DOT needs to drop from the call. So may I present it, it, an old it, it, business? Well, uh, uh, if just Jim is finished. Hold, hold on one uh, second. Well, I, 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 I was, uh, hold plan, on one second. I have the builder's plan, Kelly, if you want to reference it. I know we shared it after the group, and I thought we discussed it a little bit on the call, but I can pull it up if you want to, if you, if we want to reference, if he has, if you want to answer that question, I don't know. Sure. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Are you speaking to me? I, I can't. No, uh... she's actually speaking to, to me, um, Ms. Um, Ms. Oh, okay. Kelly Buford, and she's saying that she has the builder's plan for that. Thanks, Deb. The, yep. The builder's plans for, for uh, the, uh, the pedestrian walk. Correct. Right. It's the pedestrian walk is right here. Uh, uh, the map street of 242nd and then Bruss Park is here. Um, and then this is the building plan. They plan to put some plantings here. Um, I know that there was a concern that maybe we're going to use this area as a, a driveway to access the rear of their building where they'll be parking. But it appears, according to the plan, at least, that there will be plantings and a terrace so that they won't that that the access well, to that parking space yes, is I'm, yeah and no I'm not, I'm not talking about within the lot there i'm talking about what the part of the the uh the uh what is 242nd street uh that goes out and meets waldo avenue or, or manhattan college park or whichever you call it at that point mm -hmm. what, what's going to happen with that bit i know the plantings will be on on the on the triangle uh but so I, I'm, I'm trying to find out what's going to happen how will it connect with well, uh, hopefully it'll be a pedestrian walk out to the road it, it's unclear except that the existing trees will be protected here so there's no indication that they're going to be building a road um it just is no no as a, as a as a point of reference on this plan so that's all we we've, we've got is it that that map street is a point of reference yeah that map street which is not a street whatsoever. Right, no, no. Uh, that we're not we're not talking about that. We're talking about the what is has been a driveway for the for the old building there. Uh, gonna... We had a promise from from DOT that it was going to be a pedestrian walk. That's a different. Uh, 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 they have a different commissioner now, but uh, he uh, Navardo uh, Lopez said that pedestrian walk was. Uh, was the plan, or at least that he said he, he that that's what he favored, and uh, so I just want to make sure that that's going to actually be a pedestrian walk, and they're not going to put a driveway in there because a driveway would be uh, if you have a, a if you have a school or something in there, it'll be a traffic nightmare. You got uh, you got that bit of road intersecting Manhattan College, hundred feet down, you got a, a you got a traffic light, so it will be. Uh, two traffic lights within 100 feet of each other, it'll be pretty terrible. It'll be, you know, and it's right next to the park. There'll be children crossing there. It's a blind driveway. Uh, I, you can see it would, it, it would not be a good thing. Okay. Ms. Wacker, we will get back to you with additional information, okay? Yeah, uh, well, that's what I thought. I mean, this was two months ago we went over this, and now it's, um, it's apparently it was, nothing's happened. We will get back to you with additional information. Okay. Okay, you got my, you want my email? 
you can um, call, um, send your email um, to the office. And we'll okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be a pain about this, no, but it's, it's, you know, this, this, builder has not, <laughs> this builder has not been very good faith all along. And uh, we, I sort of expect he'll show up there with a, with a truckload of asphalt and just pave the whole thing. No, you're not being a pain. Please don't think you're being a pain. Okay. Okay. Thank well, you. thanks very much. I appreciate what you guys are doing over there. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, Jody Colon. Thank you. Um, old business in that I've had conversations with Kira about this, and I also had emailed interim commissioner Kalb. I heard that the Bradley Terrace Depth Street, also now known as John J. McKelvey Jr. Way, um, was going to be repaired by having it concreted over. And that is the stair street that we had requested in a budget request to um, preserve the asphalt hex pavers. So I was wondering if there was any update on that, whether that work was going forward or whether they were going to, my email to the commissioner basically said like hex pavers can be pulled out and reset. You know, does it need to be fully replaced with concrete? That's not what we requested. So um, do you know if any anything has happened with that, if there was a response or? Um, give me a couple of minutes. I believe there was a response, but I need to look at something or I will contact you with that, okay? Okay, great. My original inquiry was January 30th, if that helps. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, we can now move to new business. And I believe Ms. Fasciani, Barbara Fasciani, are you on the call? I am, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you. Uh, I live um, in Tippett Towers on 231st Street and Tippett Avenue. Uh, it's a two building complex um, and the north corner of 230 of that block, which is the corner of 232nd and Tibbet, um, is presently um, a construction site for a charter school. Um, I don't know how often any of you come down to 231st Street in the morning, um, but we are living for many years with a severe traffic problem. Cars that are coming southbound on Tibbet Avenue uh, sometimes are backed up to 234th Street for 10 or 15 minutes before they can get to the 231st Street intersection because it's the hub of the buses, it's the end of the bus line, um, and there are um, 14 schools in a four block area. So there are a number of cars with teachers and students and minibuses and um, most of the streets around where I am living are very narrow. And my fear is um, the one block that the school is facing um, between Irwin Avenue and Tibbet Avenue um, is narrow. And there is no doubt in my mind that there will be double parked cars on both sides of that street. Um, there is no provision with the, with the um, map that was provided of a place for school buses to pull over. Um, there is um, a, a plan for 300 students to attend that school daily. It's being built on a lot that's 50 by 100. There was one family private house there previously. Um, I just want to bring your attention to the fact that um, parking is difficult now and a number of us who are forming an opposition to this whole construction are concerned that property values will be affected because people are not going to be, they're not gonna find the neighborhood as welcoming as I did when I moved here many, many years ago. Um, there is just no place to park. There's no place to, to, to unload children safely from a car or from a school bus. Um, the school is adjacent to the parking lot for my building, 
It is an active driveway. Um, from whatever angle you look at it, this is a bad idea. Um, unfortunately, this school is being built on an as of right property. So they have not done any environmental studies, any traffic studies. They cannot be mandated to do it. Um, we have stopped work just last week because there are a number of DOB violations. But if that school goes ahead and it's a seven story building with 300 children and I don't know how many teachers and no plans for parking, either for the people who work there or for the people who are bringing their kids there, I think it's gonna be a very dangerous situation in that particular area. There is no way for um, an ambulance to get through or a fire truck, should there be any kind of emergency on those couple of blocks. Um, and I just would love if somebody would take the time to come down to 231st Street and Tippett Avenue at eight o'clock in the morning to see what it looks like and to hear what we are all woken up to every day with horns blaring and people shouting and there's a lot of frustration. So thank you for letting me have my little time and um, I will follow up and see if, if we can perhaps get some support from your group. Thank you. Thank you. I will um, state, um, Ms. Asiani, that I did notice in Assemblyman Dinowitz's um, release this week that um, he, Council Member Dinowitz and Senator Jackson have requested DOT to do a traffic study in that area. Excellent. Thank you. I didn't, I, did, I was not aware. Yes. That's good news. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other new business? Okay. Then we can go to what will now be the last item on the agenda, which is the fiscal year 2025 capital and expense request. Uh, uh, yeah. Chair, yeah. I apologize. My, my okay. hand kind of got a delay in getting up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to um, sort of give you an, an early uh, notice that likely the support um, and input of the Traffic and Transportation Committee will be uh, requested probably over the next month from uh, Environment and Sanitation. We had yesterday a meeting and uh, our uh, Vice Chair Rob uh, Bofanuzi uh, presented um, a matter that we would like to pursue with you regarding the uh, MTA um, piece of property that is the basically the southern part of what will be the Daylight in Tibet's Brook uh, corridor. So just kind of wanted to, to let you know that we may be in process of, of drafting a resolution and we would much, uh, we will refer to you obviously and to the uh, Traffic and Transportation Committee for, for input. So just kind of wanted to, to put that on your radar and on the radar of the committee and we will follow up with uh, correspondence to, to that effect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just muted myself. I'm budgeting. Um, earlier, uh, the, the committee received, um, we had a robust discussion last week. I mean, last month, sorry, it's been a long day. Um, regarding um, potential um, requests to put before DLT um, regarding spots in the area. We know the step streets are always a critical um, portion of that uh, presentation. And just before we go through the list of things that we have and we start the prior to prioritization, um, I wanted to know if anyone had any additional to add to the list. Okay, so I will read what we have, or maybe I'll put it up. Are you able to see my screen? Hello? Uh, yes. Yes. Now. Yep. Just need to okay. unmute. Yep. 
Okay, thank you. Yes. So, proposed priorities for step streets. We have the replace the rusted railings and re remortar the cobbles on the step street at West 238th Street between Orloff and Cannon Place. We also have uh, repaired the aging rebar and replaced the rusted railings and rewarded the cobbles on Marble Hill Lane Step Street near West 228th Street and Marble Hill Avenue, as well as replace the railings and repaint lamp posts on the Godwin Terrace Step Street between West 231st Street and Maples Terrace. The capital um, requests reconstruct the Naples Terrace Step Street from Broadway to Garden Terrace. Um, and this was also included in the 10-year plan. Reconstruct the West to 29th Street Step Street from Kingsbridge Terrace to Sedgwick Avenue. Reconstruct the Van Cortland Park South Step Street from Van Cortland Park South to Gale, to Gale Place. Reconstruct the West 231st Street Step Street between Sedgwick Avenue and Kingsbridge Terrace. Reconstruct Bradley Terrace Step Street between Independence Avenue and Palisade Avenue with integrated green infrastructure and restoration of the historic fencing and the hexagonal pavers. Um, so, um, and then several maintenance requests to repaint the railings and lampposts. Um, at West 230th, Riverdale Avenue, Johnson Avenue, Edge Hill and Netherland, 232nd, Johnson and Netherland, 232nd between Riverdale and Irwin and 238 Irwin. Um, and Waldo, as well as Broadway between West 231st and 232nd Streets. We also have replaced the missing bench seat and repaint railings. Um, and that's adjacent to the building at 3860 Bailey Avenue between Bailey Avenue and Olaf. Did that seem to recapture? Is that an accurate um, reflection of what we discussed last time? Yes. Uh, I think that, can we go back to the Bradley Terrace? It's right about there, right there, right there. Mm -hmm. um, Independence Avenue meets Palisade Avenue at the top of the steps. Okay. And so it is between there and um, Edge Hill or Edge the uh, Spite and Dival train um, uh, access road. I'm not sure what it's referred to. Jody, do you know a better name for that? I think it's Edsel Avenue. Edsel, yes. E D S A L L. So I would say Palisade Avenue. It, it's at Independence, but it's Palisade between Palisade Avenue and Edge Hill Avenue. So remove Independence. Then, yeah, saying. yeah. Well, it's at Independence Ave, uh, right? That's what you're saying? Well, yes, but I mean. To reconstruct Bradley Terrace Step Street at Independence Avenue. Right, and Independence between... Avenue hits Palisade, and then there's the stairs. It doesn't continue, it's called Bradley. So it's at Independence between Palisade Avenue and Edsel Avenue. That, this is the thing I asked about. Yeah. <clears throat> No, okay. Uh, let's try this again. Reconstruct Bradley Terrace Step Street at, at uh, Independence Avenue between Palisade Avenue and Edsel because Edsel never hits Independence. And that would be just more confusing. So swap Edsel <laughs> Avenue with okay Palisade Avenue. Swatch. There you go. Okay. Anything else? Now, this is just about the step streets. Right. Okay. Um, 
was this what uh, DOT said they wanted to to better uh, state the issue from uh, the budget? And it's not what I recall. These are different ones. I'm going to pull up the. Let me stop sharing that. Yeah, the uh, the original one. one was, last, yeah, last year combined all of them, David. I'm, I'm sorry. What did? That the original ones from last year combined, so a lot of them all to one thing. And we thought, I think when we discussed this last month, we thought we would break them out so that we could prioritize individual step streets, um, so that we, you know, so that we could actually have like a, a, an individual step street that we were advocating for. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I wasn't here last month. Um, I, I think that uh, CD8 is unique in that regard. And, and folks, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that CD8 is unique in the uh, in its um, proliferation of step streets. And so therefore, basically, I think we need to say, we got a lot of step streets and we got a lot of problems with those step streets. Um, uh, rather than trying to choose one over the other, uh, we may want to prioritize within the, the list of, eight or 10 of them, but um, I don't know. I wonder wh whether it's worthwhile to choose three step streets as a higher priority and then move on to other topics. Um, again, you may have discussed this last month. We can try to prioritize them, but there are a lot of step streets as you, you mentioned. Um, and just you know, pull out three, but I don't think that would really help us in that regard. We try to put all of them together. Um, last year and DOTs was excuse was they're not contiguous, so you need to you know tell us they're not in the same geographic location, they're not contiguous, and go go back to the drawing board, right? We did state okay. to in in our response that you know. They're not contiguous. We recognize that, but they yeah. are also located in parts of the community where they connect parts of the community with the central transit hubs and shopping districts um, within those communities. And there's no way of getting around it. It's not going to be contiguous. So what they're looking for, we can't create for them. Um, yeah, I, I understand the problem they're pointing out, but I'm not sure that uh, we they've given us a good way to address it. Um, th their point is fair, but I don't know that we have a good way to to really address this cleanly. But I don't know. I mean, in the past, they've been kind of approving a, a one step street reconstruction every year or two. We've got the Summit Street one that's on the capital commitment plan, and I think now we've got another one that's on the capital commitment plan. So that just may be a way of approaching it is just continuing to move them up so that we, you know, our top three always has a step street. Um, I mean, they did 229th already and that's all finished so that we can now do the second half of 229th. Um, so, I mean, I would suggest just, you know, taking taking the step street descriptions, putting them into our grid and, and just deciding which one or two we really want to have in the top, okay. 10, top five. Fair, fair enough. Um, is anybody uh, expert enough to really be able to say which is uh, worse than another because I, I don't know all the step streets so I can't really comment on. Um, I the the two twenty ninth one is is um is two se segments of of step street and they have done the lower one the upper one is 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 really pretty bad I would say that's probably one of the worst and then I have to pull the where I pull this Kelly do you want to pull the list back up or I can pull my list up I just had it up. Okay. Um, 229th between Kingsbridge Terrace and Sedgwick. So it's the, it's the okay. upper part. I see. Um, and then there's the Bradley Terrace Step Street, which uh, Jody was just talking about. Um, that one just for, that one requires patching of some sort because there are holes in it but i put it on because i know it takes years for them to get to some of these things but uh jody yeah yes um you're right uh the the historic fencing i thought that uh timber took care of that 
uh, when they were done with their scaffolds. All they did was put back the piece they ripped off. So the fence is um, almost down to the orange Rust-Oleum co coating, whatever it is. Almost all the paint is gone off of the fence. Oh, okay. So that's what you mean by restoration. Yeah, there's, I mean- oh, okay. There was... I thought you were referring to uh, replacing it back into uh, position, but okay. So no, maybe no, no. we should it's just a... say uh, stripping rusted... and painting. It, it's rusted. Um, some of the footings seem to be rusted out, but okay. like I said, it needs patching now, but will need replacement. And this, like Deb just said, they do a couple of step streets, but not everyone that we request. So I'm being uh, preemptive that by the time it gets approved in two years or three years, it will need work. Well, it, it gets I, I beat up by it gets beat up by the storms and the ice and you know the traffic. It's highly trafficked to the train station. Well, I mean, it seems like uh, you know we, we can say that the two twenty nine, the lower portion, has been done. Uh, and and thank you. And uh, now we need to uh, uh, deal with the upper portion that has severely deteriorated. But that should be the, the, a high priority. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, I the, live the by Naples, and, and, the, Re the Naples Terrace one has already um, been included in the ten-year plan, so that's right, good. Right. Exactly. Um, and then the two twenty-ninth one. I mean, um, and then I I would say that the uh, Van Cortlandt Park South one and the two thirty. First Street one are are both kind of in, in, approaching decrepit. Um, they're not near. They're not nearly as bad as two twenty ninth, but they both could. They both have a lot of use. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, but uh, uh, what I was trying to get at it was that as much as I live by and really like Bradley Terrace, it seems like it's in relatively, and I underscore relatively okay. good health. Yeah, well, and just even by Jody's description, that it's yeah. like I would say, like the two thirty first and Van Cortlandt Park South both would need to be fixed now. They're just not as bad as two twenty ninth, which is actually falling apart quite badly. Uh -huh. And same with like Naples Terrace. I'm glad that they they're doing that. Same with Summit Street. There's like the ones that are that are there. They really need it. Those two, I would say, are the other two that really need it. Uh, so, Madam Chair, perhaps we could take some pictures. You know, split them up. Have committee members take pictures, and we could reevaluate next month. And that way, everybody's looking at the screen. And I certainly don't mind doing two or three of these. Right. Thank it, you. It, I was going to suggest a field trip. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, I like your idea, Dan. Yeah, do I'll take two. Do we need a permission note? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Deb, yeah. it, yep. it, does it make a sense to sort of combine uh, 231 with 229? Because I they must be rather nearby. And it, it would get to. So they're just going to do that thing to us again of saying they're not contiguous, and then it doesn't even get considered. Because they really okay. have just been doing one step street, and they just put it onto the, onto the ten year plan. Right. I thought they uh, made some comment about wanting them to, to be, uh, where a possible together. A but... program. I mean, they they that's that seemed to be the other piece was like they wanted to either be one specific site or they wanted to be a whole program. But it seems like it would be a fool's errand to waste a year making a budget priority that says fix all of our step streets right. um, or, or reconstruct them all. I mean, I did include on that list that Kelly had up the budget item. They have money for doing step streets um, that's been allocated. So it's a good year, it seems like, to ask for maintenance requests. Because, um, I mean, how many other places have step streets? That's uh, what I, I said at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's been money allocated for 2025, 2026, and 2027. Um, so that seemed worth pointing out. <clears throat> so can we add these three maybe to the list, and then we can figure out where in the order? I mean, and plus, and plus Bradley Terrace. We should we should leave that behind. I think we should probably just look at all of them now. Look, yeah, I would say we look at all of them. 
Does they win the pictures, look at the pictures, and then be able to decide which way to move them around? Yeah. Yeah. So to just. Well, I'll volunteer for Bradley Terrace pictures. Thank you, David. I can take um, Van Cortland. I'll do 229 and 231. There you go. Thank you. Do we have a Naples Terrace, right? We have a Reconstruct Naples up there? Yes. That one's already funded, though. That so. one's funded, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, it, if somebody goes by, it's worth having pictures just to compare. Okay. In fact, I will be going to the dentist tomorrow, so I'll stop by. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I will add these to the spreadsheet. Um, and then we can start building out our priorities next month. I almost said next year, um, next month. Um, In theory, <laughs> we, should be, we, we should have our priorities now and finalize them uh, next month. But it's... Uh, well, we just said that we were going to look at, you know, these items here, these four items. I can certainly pull up the spreadsheet that we have so far. But if we're going to add these to it, um, that may change the order. That's fine. Uh, okay. they, they won't be uh, cast in stone. You able to see the spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in the spreadsheet, we have Capitol, Dickinson Avenue, uh, and Sedgwick. I don't think that needs to be our number one priority. Well, Although, right. It's it's just here. None of these are prioritized. So it's just okay. here. Um, Kingsbridge Road, um, I have to drive up Kingsbridge Road or down Kingsbridge Road um, to see if they did anything. There's a, lots of patching. I, uh, I uh, severely damaged a rim in one of their potholes. Oh, no. Uh, the problem with that stretch, particularly between uh, uh, Bailey and I think that's Kingsbridge Terrace, is that it's such a slope, they really can't pave it, uh, at least not with asphalt. They have to do a you know, slow, deliberate concrete thing, uh, which is great until it's not, because then it, it breaks sharply mm -hmm. and that's what it does in your wheels. It, it doesn't decay like asphalt, it breaks out in chunks. And that's why I think they want the, uh, to talk about it at the borough commissioner's office because that's a pretty big capital project. Right. Hmm. 235th Street pedestrian walkway and Henry Hudson Parkway, we've discussed this. Um, yeah, that really needs. Mm -hmm. And we need the feasibility, light. But it's a feasibility study. Right. It needs to be done. It's It's bad. So that wording doesn't have it as a feasibility study? It does. Fourth line. Oh, feasibility study for the ramps. Okay. I see. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So because really that is the issue. We combine those two. Yeah, because because the the cross the walkway itself is fine. Uh it's so I don't know don't how the hell to... they're gonna deal with it. The... Fine, it's shipped up, David. It's not fine. Uh, the, the crossover? Yeah, I walk. I walk. Get over there. I live oh, right yeah, there. I was there two weeks ago. I didn't notice that, but okay, oh, okay, okay. I believe you. 
So didn't they just do something there, some sort of renovation? Is that they is that all checked up now, Mary Ellen? Yeah. No, they they're, they're going to be working on two thirty second Street bridge and the retaining wall. It's down a little bit more. Right, that's the Henry Hudson Parkway right project from right. two three one to two three five. The yes. the retaining wall between the Henry Hudson Parkway and the service road is buckling, and that's gonna that that's what they're gonna be doing uh, for the next couple of months. And that's mm -hmm. why they took away the parking. That's why they took away, they shifted yeah. the lanes, etc. But that was about the buckling wall. While you're scrolling, I looked up. We have 25 step streets in Bronx, eight out of 108 step streets citywide. Wow. wow. Because it's that many. I, I would have I would have guessed eight or twelve. Wow. Yeah. Um, I uh, open data has all kinds of crazy stuff. So I found the open data list. Yeah. Yeah, That's I went a lot. yeah, I'll 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 send you the link. Thank you. Yeah, I, I went through some of their training yesterday and today. There's there's a lot of data out there that you can research. Well, yeah, it's Geek Week. I had sent that to Luke yep. and Pablo in case they wanted to attend. It's it's data geek week. There's presentations um, right. on how right. to yeah, they, the they, data. Yeah. Yeah, they sent it to us uh, Monday, and uh, so I got into yesterday and today's sessions. Okay. Would it, would it be helpful to do that game where you kind of start at the top and you, you look at the thing below it and say, okay, should this be above it or not? Jody suggested this last night for a different committee meeting priorities thing, but that's that's always a, often a good way to kind of end up with the list that you want. But, but I think we need to clarify the definition. Like um, if you go back up to the 235th Street thing, uh, just right there, um, and... I find it curious that uh, they say it's going to needs both DOT and DEP results may merit a capital project. We will advise upon completion of investigation. Um, Didn't they already say that they needed a capital project? They're the ones who told us that it needed a sewer installed. And uh, yes, yeah. we've been saying for the past six years, couple of years that yeah. it needs to say a three. It's really a priority because you have elderly people going over that bridge, going grocery shopping. That's their way to get over to the shopping areas and the restaurants. No, no, uh, Marianne, we're talking about the 235th Street sidewalk. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Oh, the sidewalk is about the bridge. Uh, yeah, the sidewalk, yeah. not the bridge. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of torn as to whether we want to put it in as a priority um, or maybe just uh, notify or remind DOT we're waiting for their the results of their investigation vis-a-vis -vis a capital project. They, they, we know it's a priority, though. They already they did say it, so I don't know why they're that where that comment's even coming from. Yeah, it, it's disingenuous. They they know it's a capital priority. Yeah, yeah it is, but that is with the response they gave us um, in yeah, February to our capital request. They're saying it may. Yeah, they're agreeing with us. It's, they they're agreeing with us. That's their comment. no. I understand that, but um... yeah. Rosemary, you had your hand up. Rosemary, Gates. yes. Thank thank you very much. I'm I'm not a member of the committee, so I thought it better to raise my hand on this particular issue. Um, the uh, comment from uh, budget was uh, needs to be investigated by DOT and DEP. Results may merit may merit a uh, capital project. At the hearing uh, that was held on uh, response to the budget comments, I commented, I don't think that that response is clear. 
that it needs to be investigated, does that mean they will investigate it? And I ask that that be sent as part, as part, as, as our comment on their comments. Uh, have we heard back from the city on the comments we sent in? Number one question, okay. And, and, and number two, I, I, I still don't understand what it mean, needs to be investigated by DOT and DEP, does that mean it will be investigated? Uh, I just want to say one more thing. I just want to say one more thing. This project or this request bewilders me. Again, you know the past history. This goes back years. 254th and 235th were, were linked arm in arm, but 254th took off and this just sat there. Please understand this with 235th. It is the obligation of the property owner to do this work. If the property owner refuses to do it, the city can do it, and the city will bill, will bill the property owner. The fact remains, if the property owner refuses to do it, which they have, the city can do it and bill the property owner. This is not, we, the city will have to upfront the money, but will be repaid. This is no big deal. Why this doesn't jump to the head of their list and say, of course we'll do it because at the end of the day, it's zero sum for us. Please everybody remember that on this request. This is not city money going out that we'll never see again. It's city money up fronting a project to which they will be fully reimbursed by the property owner because it's their obligation. Thank you. Sorry, I just I had to say that somehow I think it gets lost in the shuffle. But more importantly, OMB said needs to be investigated. Does that mean will be investigated? If that's the case, then the request should be a different request. Then up, up the study. OK, okay again, you want to say what I'm saying, I think. I do remember you saying that, Rosemary, and a and couple of meetings back, a couple of years back even. So years back, I'm talking six, seven, eight years back. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. But right. thank you for listening. You. You're welcome. Thank you for the information. It's helpful to those of us that were not on the board at that time. So thank you. I appreciate your comments. Hi team. How are we doing? Any other comments on this? Okay, so Broadway corridor, we can just tell them to do the study. Uh, we can ask them to do the study. Contact, right. the right. contact, they said contact the borough commissioner's office to discuss this request. Right. right. Okay, yeah. requires further study. Right. The request for the study requires some study. study. Exactly. <laughs> so I guess if that's the case, I mean, are they, well, I guess we'll come back to it next month. We just need to send an email to the borough commissioner's office to see what it is that they're asking for. Or why it is that they want to discuss it? I mean, it, sure. it's not like yeah. they're saying go to your council members for funding. They're saying please contact us to discuss it. I guess we could send them an email, maybe. We can send them an email, and and that will be us contacting them to discuss it. So, hey, what would you like to discuss? Right. Looks like we have another one down there, Putnam Avenue Greenway Connections. Contact the Borough Commissioner's Office to discuss. Safe crossings, let's discuss. P 
so what I will do is add the additional items to this sheet. Um, the ones that we just said, we will contact the borough commissioner's office. Um, mm -hmm. We'll send them an email, put them lower on the sheet. But if I will, I will distribute the um, spreadsheet to the committee this weekend. And if everyone could do their rankings and then at the, the next meeting, um, we can um, go through the rankings an aggregated ranking system here. Does that work for people? Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just yes, one please. thing. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. I, I wanted to, uh, go look at some, something here. The, the, the thing about, uh, the independence Avenue sidewalk, uh, the two, three below regarding 5,900 Arlington there. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it, I don't think it has anything to do with independence Avenue. Um, it's the of a new step street connecting Arlington from 5900 Arlington to West 261st Street. Right? I think it's in the, I, we'll have to look again. Uh, I, I, that's what I just did look at the map. And uh, and Independence is um, a block west, sort of. It, it, it actually dies off. That's um, just it. I think that's the extension. It's mapped. It is mapped, David. Oh, I, oh, yeah. okay. Arlington becomes Independence Avenue yeah. as it wraps around Skyview. I'm sorry. It, I it, it seems that. like a parking lot back there, but it's actually Independence Avenue. Yeah, yeah I, I, did, I didn't know it changed its name. I, my, my mistake. I'm, I apologize. Yep. Wow. That's weird. <laughs> so are It's almost as weird as... Two Independence Avenues uh, uh, feeding into Palisade Avenue. Mm -hmm. One that doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Wow, I never noticed that. Huh. Um, Kelly, would it help if we ranked the like to when to between now and the next meeting? Would it help if we took the list and ranked for our own individual rankings and then submitted it to you so you could aggregate them so you had a rough? Yes, order? That's what I, yes, that's what I just asked. Definitely. Oh, you wanted us to send them to you? I wasn't sure if you just yeah. wanted us to keep them and come. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm going to send it to you. You, you, do your stuff. Send them back to me, and then we'll aggregate them. Okay. That's uh, good. Uh, and uh, what deadline do you want to give us for that? I hint, say, hint. That's a hint. I got you, David. Um, if would a week be unreasonable for people? Can it be um, a week plus the additional weekend? So we have two weekends. Sure, I can do that. So I'll just say two weeks. Like Monday. Okay. The 30th, Thursday, the 30th. Sure. I'm not sending this to you before the weekend, just so we're clear. <laughs> Good. Okay. No, oh, okay. Please do okay. not. <laughs> Why? You got a life? Um, yeah, I try to have one. Yeah. Outside of CBA. What? I know, right? What were you thinking? I have no idea, Deb. Okay, so we, we have a plan. It's okay. There is a recovery group that's formed for former chairs of traffic and transportation. So, yeah, yeah, but you, the ale house. Not, but but you're not smart enough to leave the committee. <laughs> Both of you. Yeah. They wanted to help the new chair, David. Thank you. Love of the game. Love of the game. Exactly. David, that's why there's a recovery group. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was in that movie for the love of the game. <laughs> okay, so we have a plan. Um, does anyone else have anything? Does anyone have anything else they would like to bring before the committee at this time? Okay. Hearing nothing. I have a motion to adjourn. You have it. For motion to adjourn. I second yep. it. There you go. My third. All right, have a great one, everybody. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.